This is Batbeard Games. What a Batbeard is, I don't know. How one relates to games, I couldn't say. But that is not the topic of this video. Rather, we will be exploring his use of logic and how it looks in comparison to the proper use of logic. Hello everybody, my name is Brian and last week I put out a bunch of videos that I feel like I need to apologize for. First, I made the videos in a very reactionary way. I was more reacting to things than I was researching things. There were two videos actually presented on the issue of BetterHelp. Both videos were reactionary, but they were also defensive on behalf of BetterHelp and DeFranco. The backlash you received was less from reaction and more from defensiveness. In response to those videos, I posted comments designed to illustrate your lack of research. You acknowledged my points, showing a few of the items you were wrong about. You accepted that they were correct, and you appreciated the comments. Then you took the videos down, presumably to avoid more backlash, and replaced them with this video. To be honest, I don't feel an apology is warranted. Everyone is entitled to an opinion, even if they are wrong. But if you must apologize, so be it. Where do I come in? In your first two videos, I simply wanted to show you the facts that put a question mark on your unresearched claims. I was content to simply comment, but in your third attempt, you have gone straight past mere emotional reaction to an area that I am well versed in, logic. My attempt to show you the value of research through comments failed, so I must escalate to a video response. I have nothing against you, personally, but I am about to pick apart your logical explanations of your emotional overreaction. Based on the faulty research about logic you did, instead of researching on the situation to which you were initially reacting. Now I'd like to get into what I've written this morning. Because I mentioned once that I wanted to play devil's advocate. And somebody is saying, no, you're not being devil's advocate. And that's kind of funny because in common parlance, the term devil's advocate describes someone who given a certain point of view, takes a position he or she does not necessarily agree with, or an alternative position from the accepted norm. But you were not playing devil's advocate. You were producing videos that, while they may have been contrary to the apparent position, were emotional reactions in defense of a norm. They were not well thought out and or researched positions of opposition designed to test or further a norm. You were being reactionary, not a devil's advocate. You failed to completely read or understand the definition you presented. Okay, so this is what I wrote this morning. It's argumentative fallacies and it's logical fallacies. Without a source for these fallacies, I'm going to presume that you found a list of fallacies online, probably at Wikipedia, and set about applying them to the better help debate as you saw fit. I doubt that you have any formal training or even informal experience in using logic. And we're about to see why. So, in the last video I made, which I, I privated because things were, getting, things were getting toxic in there, and I don't think I did a very good job, and again, what I did was amateur, I'm sorry. But let's try to make things a little bit more professional here. And I'm taking this into the hypothetical, even though it's... I know, it's, it's going to be exactly the debate that we have. Well, we are already on shaky ground. When attempting to have a debate based on a foundation of logic, we must choose our words very carefully. By taking things toward the professional, are we to assume that you have earned a doctorate in philosophy, or that someone pays you to debate or teach logic? And, hypothetically, will you be proposing hypotheses or will you simply be developing analogs of ongoing real-world situations? I can't see how either would be necessary in this situation. Um, so the claim is X company is a scam. So this could apply to BetterHelp. It can apply to any other company. But we have a claim. This company is a scam. In logic, this is not merely a claim. It is a positive claim. It is important to make that distinction because different types of claims have different burdens of proof. The company is a scam has a simple burden of proof. The company is a scam to take all your money and play the stock market has three simple burdens of proof. 
thus a higher burden of proof. The company is not a scam. Another simple burden of proof. I see no evidence of the scam, is no claim, and requires no proof. So these are very general terms. These terms have a lot to be justified. So uh, to make a blanket statement, it is a blanket statement. Um, there's, there's a big uphill that we have to go through. No, you are wrong. If company X refers to a specific company and the word scam refers to an established set of crimes, these are not general terms or blanket statements. You may need multiple proofs for separate claims. That is, each crime in the set. But proof in positive for any one of them is proof of the set. Beliefs don't require justification, but claims require proof. Proofs that would not be very up the hill. Now, uh, here's a counter argument. Um, and this, I wrote this. Um, users are reporting contractors of the company did not provide service that was paid for. Assuming this claim is valid, Next, it must be established that the rate of these reports exceed the rate that can validate the general claim that X company is a scam. So, some scams have happened. To say that the entire company is a scam, it, it has to climb over that threshold, that burden of proof. That is absolutely incorrect. Firstly, there is no rate at which the company is a scam. What would that even look like? When 10% don't receive the paid-for service, or 25%, or 50%, no, that isn't how it works. Imagine if you scammed 19% of your customers, but in court you get off without penalty because you didn't meet the rate of 20%. Ridiculous. Besides, remember what I said about terms and definitions before? Scam means a class of crimes meant to deprive individuals of value without promised returns. You cannot prove a scam. You must prove its components. For example, fraud. Scam is simply layman shorthand for the class of crimes. You don't need to prove the number of cases of fraud reach a threshold, or rate, as you call it, of the total customer base. You need to prove each case of fraud individually. Any true case proves fraud. Any number of frauds or any other crime in the set may prove the general plan to commit the crimes or scam as you call it. Well, let's take let's take another company uh, for an example. Let's let's say we have a fast food joint and one of the stores has been scamming customers out of cookies for weeks, months even, and it eventually gets that store busted. Can you say, then, that the entire company is a scam? Well, if you can establish that that company was behind it, that they uh, made sure that not just that, that store, but all their stores have scammed customers out of cookies for weeks, then I think you can. You can establish that that company is a scam. But uh, to do that, you have a rather high burden of proof. That's what we would call a false analogy. One, we are not talking about a franchise in which one store has committed fraud, but others haven't. Two, we are not talking about being provided parcel service, but rather no service. Three, fraud does not have to reach the highest levels of a company to be fraud, nor do higher executives get to disclaim fraud because they don't participate. Four, franchises don't get to discover fraud in one store, then allow that store to continue to operate fraudulently while they turn a blind eye, and then say they are not participating in the fraud. And again, there is no threshold. A single case of proven fraud is a fraud, so the burden of proof is quite low. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, publicly accessible records from several sources show that rates of undelivered services are relatively low, while the rates of satisfactory services are high. Which serves to prove nothing, as these numbers are voluntarily self-reported and may be complicated by false reports in one direction or another, or simply fewer reports from one side or the other. This is an ad populum fallacy, as well as there still is no threshold requirement 
it would be as easy to say sports team X does not lose games on purpose because either A, they only lose one out of five games on purpose, or B, a survey of the most vocal fans show that only 5% believe the team loses on purpose. When what is required to prove that they do is evidence that they lost any one of their games on purpose. So to put this back in the real world situation that we are talking about, is there any proof that in any instance, BetterHelp has not refunded a customer for a session in which the counselor did not in fact show up? If so, that is fraud. Did that counselor then continue to operate on BetterHelp's platform and again did not show up and no refund was given? If so, BetterHelp is now complicit in the fraud. So then we have a new a new claim in response to that argument, and the claim is uh, those sources or the sources of those public records are faked. So what this what this is is this represents a genetic fallacy. It's a fallacy of origin, virtue. Um, it is a fallacy of irrelevance. It's based solely on something's history or origin. No, what it is is another positive claim. You can't simply dismiss positive claims as a fallacy without examination of the claim. You're appealing to the stone, logic, and probability with a bare assertion of a false equivalence. As a claim, you simply need to prove that any number of testimonials is fake. Be that one or one hundred. The history or origin of a fake review for the purposes of logic are irrelevant because it is still fake. Its origin as a matter of law is a matter of a criminal proceeding. So, why this is a fallacy? Don't mind me. I'm just saving you some embarrassment by removing your 25 seconds of attempting to justify your logical fallacy claim, in which you make no coherent point. You're welcome. So, anyway, let's, let's continue. Marketing Company X... The marketing of that company is misleading and predatory. The counter-argument is, well, all marketing is misleading. Two positive claims. One, that Company X's marketing is misleading. And two, your claim that all marketing is misleading. Of the two, yours bears the higher burden of proof. But I will put that to the side for a moment. Again, the first claim is not if all marketing is misleading, but if Company X's marketing is misleading enough to be false advertising, which is a legally established standard that falls within the definition of scam. Your positive claim is an appeal to probability, a false equivalence, an incomplete comparison by hasty generalization, to reach an irrelevant conclusion, or simply put, a fallacy of composition. And then the, the counterclaim is the marketing for this company is predatory because they promise a higher tier quality of service than they actually provide. And the car counter argument is that means it is misleading, yes, in fact, but it does not make it predatory, okay? And the claim continues, it's because they're targeting people who need real help and not this service, but they turn those people away. All of which says what? Well, let me draw an analogy of my own. If I owned a used car site, and I advertised that website by saying that not only have I used cars, but I have the exact year and model you are looking to buy. If you need a used car, come to my website and register what you're looking for. I then match the person to the vehicle they want, or a vehicle something like what they want or to something they don't want but that happens to be on hand, or to a bicycle, or to nothing at all, because I'm not matching anything to anything in actuality. The sellers of the vehicles I don't really own are matching their vehicles to whomever they think will buy them. So, neither do I have all possible desired vehicles available, nor do I have control of who gets what as a result of using my website. But regardless, I still get paid. You see, I recognized your false analogy. At what point is it predatory? When it is fraudulent. When it can't provide a service it expressly states that it does. When it targets a specific demographic that it expressly claims to serve, but is completely incapable of serving. And all of a sudden we have a new claim. 
X company is a scam because they turn people in need away. But in your last argument, if they did provide that inferior service to those people, they would be predatory. That's a catch-22. The paradoxical situation for which an individual cannot escape because of contradictory rules. That is a straw man, an appeal to consequences with a healthy splash of false dilemma. No one has claimed they are a scam because they merely turn people away in need or not. The actual claim is that they turn people which they have specifically claimed they are in the business of serving away. And other than it possibly being false advertising, I have not once heard anyone claim that is a crime, thus a scam. It is also not a catch-22, because they can both be predatory and not serve the people that might have a better legal claim against them, such as people with diagnosed disabilities who might become victims of fraud. In fact, I would expect that. Marketing affiliates, person's name, are marketing the company in an aggressive way that looks like a siphon scheme, further proving that X company is a scam. And I, I put proving in blue because that's conjecture. It's an opinion or conclusion formed on the basis of incomplete information. You conjectured your conjecture. One, by asserting a scam can be proven, I will repeat a scam cannot be proven until the individual crimes can be proven, at which point you call the collected proven crimes a scam. Argument from repetition from the masked man. Two, conflating a subjective opinion looks like into an objective claim. Conjectures are not logically fallacious. What you're looking for is incomplete comparison. An opinion is not a logical argument and not a claim. Therefore, not subject to this refutation, unless you have an evidence-backed counter-opinion. So, first of all, we can have this argument that they're marketing in an aggressive way, but that does not prove that X company is a scam. Unless such marketing is a proven crime, continued use of the mask man is bad form. Here's another counter-argument. While the actions of the affiliate do match the claims you make about the affiliate, their actions are frowned upon but not illegal. An X company is not guilty by association until you prove that they directed or sanctioned said actions. Or knowingly allowing said actions to continue. You forgot that one. A cherry picking. So guilty by association is an association fallacy. It is a logical fallacy that occurs when a person is supported or attacked because of their relationship to some other person or belief. It is a form of a non sequitur. No such fallacy applies. The definition you're reading leaves much to be desired. No one is asserting that BetterHelp and its advertisers are the same. Another straw man. BetterHelp directs who how and when their company will be promoted. There is a direct association between the company and its paid advertisers. Therefore, any fault on the advertiser's part can be linked to BetterHelp. Marketing affiliates, person's name, use the funds uh, from donations from his supporters to set up this marketing company, misappropriating those funds. Those actions of this individual have no bearing on establishing the original claim that X company is a scam. This is a non sequitur, which means it does not follow. Straight up attempting to poison the well. The entirety of the BetterHelp debate does not rest only on a single original claim. It is also potentially a fallacy fallacy to later claim the first claim to be fallacious by the presentation of additional claims. It is certainly a vacuous truth. There is a potential for the second claim to prove the first. Why is person's name defending company X so much they must be running PR for company Shake My Head? Circumstantial ad hominem points. It points out that someone is in circumstances such that they are disposed to take a particular position. It constitutes an attack of bias of the source. This is fallacious because a disposition to make a certain argument does not make the argument false. This overlaps with the genetic fallacy. A question followed by an opinion 
of a probable cause cannot be logically fallacious because there is no positive claim. You falsely equivocating. Another fallacy fallacy. Neither the question nor the opinion is an ad hominem. Can you prove that this source is paid to be biased in this case? So if you can prove that they are being paid to be biased in this case, then you can establish bias. Not that proof would be required since no positive claim was made. Yes, a proof could be presented. Was person's name paid? Would person's name have a motive to take the specified action? Did person's name have an opportunity to take the specified action? Did person's name take the specified action? However, there is no proof required of the questioner. Here's another claim. We've got a new claim. X company pays sponsors exorbitant funds for peddling their service, compromising their integrity and ability to discern the credibility of X company. That's what we call a foregone conclusion, and it works like this. If you have a source for a valuable limited resource, you are highly motivated to protect that source. Therefore, you are not likely to expose or allow exposure of that source to dangers that might restrict or remove your access to the resource. And uh, there is a counter argument here. Many testimonials suggest that X company past initial screenings of their marketing managers who verify the legitimacy of many companies the same way. Therefore, it is not the sponsors or the funds that resulted in the proliferation of X company, but their formerly good reputation. Anecdotal fallacy, all while missing the point with an ad populum argument. The terms of service for Company X have many loophole specifics. First, establishing that they don't guarantee the quality of this service. This is not unique to Industry Y, where it is commonplace for verbiage exactly like this to appear in the terms and conditions. Cross-examination. It is incredibly foolish to compare Company X with Industry Y. Conflation. Guarantee the quality of the service in the claim is not equivalent to guarantees of service in the counter argument. Moving the goalposts. Industry Y is not at debate here, only Company X. By moving the scope of your response, you are changing the standards to be met. This also represents a genetic fallacy because the origin of the example does not invalidate the argument. You absolutely move the goalpost, and therefore, any other fallacy is negated along with the argument. Fallacy, fallacy. But we established that Company X's service is inferior to Industry Y. Therefore, why should they guarantee a higher quality of service to an entire industry that doesn't? Their marketing material states their service is on par with the industry, therefore they are required to provide such service or risk violations of the law. Continuing to move the goalpost with a straw man. Company X worded their terms of service to sell users private medical data and are selling private medical data. This is a post hoc argument that because they have a terms of service that has this loophole, therefore they must be doing it. This is absolutely not post hoc. Perhaps an appeal to probability and your own argument from fallacy. And the counter argument is that that is against the law. Regardless of the wording of the contract, the law still applies to them. And if Company X has done this, they will be answering to the courts. However, there is no evidence that this has been done. Loopholes in contracts that violate the law are non-binding contracts. Argument to moderation, appeal to the stone and consequence, irrelevant conclusion. Conclusion. There's a huge chain of wrongdoing. X company is still a scam. Can't you see that? This is a post hoc ergo propter hoc argument. That after this, therefore, because of this, the term refers to a logical fallacy that because two events occurred in succession, the former event caused the latter event. Wrongdoing and scam are not cause and effect. They are identical descriptors given that chain of wrongdoing and scam describe the same events. No post hoc possible, at best an unproven assertion. 
And the counter argument is we are so far from establishing that. And yet we could never establish the truth or falsehood of any claim if everyone like you dismisses all claims as false. Thus no investigation whatsoever. And that's that's what I want to get across. And as long as we keep arguing the same fallacious points back and forth over and over, we're getting nowhere closer to the truth. If we can just narrow the arguments down to the cleanest arguments, if we can figure out, okay, what is is absent of these logical fallacies, then we can oh, we can finally get somewhere. I would consider that to be your point if you yourself had made any attempt to do just that. But your grasp on logic is so tenuous, I don't believe you would actually know how to control your own fallacies, let alone lecture others on theirs. Please choose to actually learn about logic before you make another attempt to lecture others about theirs, or simply stop lecturing others about it. It would be as it would be as easy it would be as easy to say which sir that's what we would call 